So who has a question for us? I see a hand in the back. And ho could you hold on just a moment while we get a microphone to you, please? Thank you for all those wonderful presentations. Uh, my question is brief. I was wondering where the raw material, where silver came from in the 19th uh, century. Uh, originally, um, it came from melted down coinage. If you hear the term coin silver, it literally is silver from melted down coins. And uh, the ratio was about 900 to 1,000 parts silver. In 1968, Gorham adopted the sterling standard and went up to 925. Um, and also, about that time frame, or 1859, for instance, the Comstock load was found. So major American mines of silver uh, were discovered and produced a lot of silver. So their silver would come from American mines as well. <coughs> Hello. Oh, hi. So I have a question about two aspects of Gorham's production. One is uh, jewelry, and the other is ecclesiastical. And my question is, how important were those two, and how long did they last in Gorham's production? So those of you who've, looked, who've done such extensive work in the archives, could you tell me just a little bit more about their jewelry production and their ecclesiastical production? Would anyone like to take that on? You got it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I can say is that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, jewelry seem, at least in the photo books, there's lots of jewelry. Um, and they actually reuse die stamps that were used for other things to make some of that jewelry. So, for example, the appliques that you see on the Japanese silver pieces were also used to make things like brooches and that sort of thing. So they were they were very, you know, strategic about that sort of thing. And there's as I said, lots of jewelry. I did not personally look at the ecclesiastical records. I can talk a little bit about the ecclesiastical division. I think it was one of the important divisions, obviously not as important as the silver division, um, probably less important somewhat than the bronze division, which had a wider public audience. Um, but I think it was a very important, important division for a good length of time. I believe that it was founded um, around 1880. I may have that date slightly wrong, but I think it was late 19th century. And it lasted well into the 20th century. It um, seems that almost every chalice I've looked at as a museum curator has been a Gorham one. And it, so that does not surprise me. I mean, we have um, probably 15 flat file drawers in the Hay Library of just, um, plans and blueprints and drawings for the ecclesiastical division. And they had their own separate catalog for ecclesiastical. Um, of course, this was, serving, this was serving every Christian denomination, not so sure that they were interested in working with non-Christian denominations. Uh, I didn't see much synagogue wear in there, um, although there, there could have been some. Um, but uh, they were primarily uh, looking to serve Christian denominations, but of course there were many of those. Um, certainly when, for the time period of the turn of the century when religion and the practice of religion were very important, the ecclesiastical division was certainly holding its own. And, and I think the most, one of the most important contributions of the ecclesiastical division is, they, you know, the, uh, William Codman, you know, they, they, they got him at, at 18 years old to come over, and then his father is William, right? Well, William Christmas Codman, you know, follows his son over here. So really, you know, that was what lured him over, and Codman was perhaps the most important designer. Who else has a question? Uh, first, huge congratulations to all of you. I can't wait to read the book. Um, you've done so much research. And my question is, Amy, your talk has really sparked my dreams about doing um, 
a silver hunting tour in Sumatra, Johannesburg, <laughs> Hong Kong, <laughs> and places I never Hi, dreamt of looking for Gorham. But I, do you have, I'm thinking, oh, there must be some Martelet lurking in all of those antique shops. But do you know what types of lines, maybe, and maybe Elizabeth and Emily can chime in too, that were um, most commonly retailed in other countries? I can't imagine like Martelet. The, the that, Plymouth pattern going, you know. <laughs> That's a great question. It, that is not something, information, statistics on what they sent to those, um, those far off places. Um, it's not something that I came across in my research, but certainly interesting. Well, my family had an antique shop in Johannesburg for two or three decades, and we never saw one piece of gold. <laughs> 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 um, did Gorham ever venture into developing techniques or providing techniques to its customers on how to maintain the silver? And if, it, and if so, did that change over the years? Uh, I can take that one. Yes, they did. Um, one of the things I found in the archive was a whole binder full of information on silver polishes. Gorham developed its own silver polish, and they had, you know, just as with these marketing brochures that I think um, Jean showed about how to use the chafing dish, mm -hmm. they also had brochures on how to polish your silver. Mm -hmm. So yes, they were very much keen on helping people maintain their Gorham materials in the best condition. And selling their silver polish. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Well, that too. That too. Yeah, and let me just add that in, uh, in, in publications like Vogue and other sort of shelter magazines, there were periodic articles about the same subject. And I think there was the, the subtext was, it's not that hard to maintain, buy the silver, maintain it, you know, it's, it's really very easy to do. Mm -hmm. I have a question in um, relationship, Gorham's relationship to Tiffany, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so obviously Tiffany adapted and survived um, the silver crisis of the 70s. Um, is that because its portfolio was more diverse, or how was it that Gorham had been in the lead for so long and then wasn't able to adapt to the changing world and the changing market in a way that its competitor seemed to? I got that one. <laughs> branding. Branding, branding. Actually, Peter DeGrittafaro was here. He's, I think he's, is he still there? He, he really tried to uh, forestall the, the demise of Gorham by saying, look, you know what? Those dirts up in New York are, are uh, taking a little piece of stamping, putting a big Tiffany and company on it, and telling people it's wonderful. You know, and they're, uh, they're developing the concept of brand. Why can't we do that out here? And he couldn't get a nibble. So what happened was a great deal of, of energy, you know, and hoping, my gosh, he was the 20th century uh, farmer. You know, he could, he could throw a party and he could, he could, uh, he could um, convince you that what he was doing was wonderful. He bought the Tut exhibition over and he was working for the Met. He knew exactly who to call and how many people uh, excited about branding. Also remember there was Jean Moore who did those fabulous windows who tied into the swinger idea and uh, made it very, very cool. And Gorham was sitting up here not doing that. And that's how it survived. It wasn't a question of a better product. It was a question of, of, of uh, uh, having the pulse of the, the marketing of the moment. And I, and I would say, in addition to that, that there, um, you know, Gorham was a silver manufacturer by and large, and they did not have the diversity that Tiffany had in their line. Um, also, I, when you think about how Tiffany and Gorham both started out, <laughs> Tiffany started off as a retailer, and Gorham always was a manufacturer, and there's, I think, a big difference between that. Um, Gorham was invested in silver, and what the silver market did, uh, as all of our speakers have um, you know, demonstrated, that had an, a major impact on them. 
well, and another thing is to follow on Stephen's question about jewelry, is, is Gorham never made gemstone jewelry. I mean, they made silver and gold jewelry, whereas Tiffany, of course, was famous for its gemstones. So again, they're, they're not, it's more like apples and oranges a bit with Gorham and Tiffany. They're not quite the same kind of, as you just said, as you've just said, so. I'd like to respond to uh, the market con conditions back in the 70s when the Hunt brothers tried to corner the market on silver. You touched on it uh, slightly earlier. Uh, suddenly, silver went up to about $40 an ounce, $50, $60 an ounce, $100 an ounce. Uh, consequently, the price of one sterling silver pork was well over $100. And with that, then uh, people just stopped giving silver as a wedding gift. Uh, they stopped doing that. Department stores stopped using bridal consultants. So the, the wonderful circle of silver being a tradition and the family heirloom handed down from gener generation to generation, the wonderful tradition of department stores having bridal consultants who would uh, educate the young girls about the value of silver and fine china and cut crystal, that all kind of ended abruptly. And uh, that was truly the demise of the industry. Yes, Stephen. One question that I've always had, and I thought I had obtained an answer, was that the flatware never bore date marks, that hollowware bore the date marks. But recently, I saw a set of, I think, afternoon teaspoons or small teaspoons in a fitted box, and they had right beside the Gorham and the Sterling mark, which were impressed, was an impressed boa's head which is from the 1880s. And that's the only thing that I think I've ever heard of and seen, I've seen a photograph that had a piece of, uh, had a piece of flatware with a date mark. Have you come upon other examples? We do not come across many um, that have the date mark on it. Simply, you know, there's not room for it to be there. Um, and they repeated things so many times. Mm -hmm. too, yes. I, do, anyone, would anyone else like to speak that? You typically don't get a date mark on yeah. um, the flatware. Um, it's, you get much more information on the base of the hollowware pieces. But that's interesting because that is definitely uh, one of their date marks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we found is that Gorham changed their mark so often that it's a little hard to tell what system they were using at any given time. Um, if you look at any of the online sites, that try to track Gorham date marks. It's very complicated. Well, I know in the old catalogs in the Hay Collection, or the Hay Library, they have, in the old photographs, where I believe they stop at a certain letter in the 1880s and take on the figural date marks, mm -hmm. but the catalogs go up to Z and double A and double B. Mm -hmm. So Gorham used one set for their records, but then they use something different on their silverware. Mm -hmm. Their systems were very complex, <laughs> very complex. Yes? I think I can answer a little bit. Uh, Gorham did date mark specialty flatware, like the cast pieces, the very special cast pieces like bonbonniers and uh, other little pieces frequently are, are date marked uh, from 1890s up until the early 1900s. Uh, but General line patterns, no. Mm -hmm. However, some specialty pieces in line patterns are also date marked, but that's quite rare. But the but the specialty pieces, like the bonbonniers and other cast pieces, are frequently showing up with date marks. So from, Thank you. From that, that surmise that um, you know with the patterns that they intend to sell a lot and bring back from time to time, they don't want to date. Where, whereas a, um, you know, a specialty thing, they're only going to make it once, so put a date on it. That makes some sense. I have a question here. Yeah, what is the status of developing digital finding aids for the collection? My point is that if, if for example, someone has a, a uh, samovar and they wanted to attempt to identify whether or not it's a Gorham piece. Have you started to 
create digital finding aids for uh, ledger books and pattern books and so on? Um, let me tell you something that that is something we would very much like to do, but there is 6,000 linear feet of material. And every time I try to bring a proposal to my bosses, people throw up their hands in despair because they can't imagine tackling this entire thing. So I've been trying to propose ways to chip off pieces of Gorham that are doable on their own with the idea that we could create smaller finding aids and then link them through an, an umbrella finding aid. But still, so, so far, I'm not getting much traction. Hopefully, that will change. Yeah, the NEH is probably not going to help. No. Uh, <laughs> Not at the current rates they're being funded. Okay. Jeff. <laughs> uh, if I may be so bold, if all of you love the silver that you're seeing upstairs, I'm the founder of the Society of American Silversmiths. There are very few of us left in this country. Uh, all the big manufacturers have left, with the exception of Tiffany, which is primarily making uh, production pieces. So call the society. You can find us on, this, on, on the internet, Society of American Silversmiths, silversmithing.com, and ask to have a special piece made just for you, for an anniversary, for a birthday. It can be a piece of flatware, something relatively inexpensive that can be designed by any one of us or in your particular style. It's going to be beautifully made. It will. I can't say it's absolutely going to hold its value, but it's going to be more valuable than the production pieces that have been made over the centuries in this country. And we have a great heritage here. And so if we're not, if, uh, if business isn't kept going, then when we're no longer here, which could be in the next 30 or 40 years, where are you going to buy a beautiful piece of silver? That's the promotional, uh, <laughs> promotional segment of today. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm curious about, um, I'm curious about some special commissions. Um, Emily, you showed uh, that great Sachem Cup um, yachting trophy, and I'm wondering, um, those of you that have done so much work in the archives, what you've come across as far as um, you know, trophies or other special commissions, who was commissioning those, whether that's a yacht club commissioning that, whether that's the owner of Sachem, whether that information um, accompanies uh, the records that you find and possibly also where they were commissioned, whether that's happening in Newport, I mean, excuse me, in New York at the retail stores or um, just any interesting factoids you've come across. I can take that one. Um, in the drawings that we have at the Hay Library, there are, are a ton of trophies um, from all kinds of sports clubs. There, sorry, um, there are lots of horse racing trophies, and I've had contact with folks at the Kentucky Derby Museum, indicating that they have some Gorham trophies there. We know there are also know there are Gorham trophies at the New York Yacht Club. Um, any group anywhere across the country could commission a trophy from Gorham, and often they did. Gorham trophies were also considered for industrial organizations. Uh, when Elizabeth and Emily and I were going through all the drawings, we found a ton of weird-looking trophies for um, industrial. Aviation. Well, there are a lot of aviation yeah. trophies, but I think those are sporting clubs. But the ones that really stuck with me are the ones for some kind of industrial award. Yeah, some steel company, and they were, they were, the designs were really kind of interesting, very modern, um, very oriented toward that industry, but not what you'd expect. It's not a typical trophy design. It really incorporated something about the industry in there. So there, it, it really is a very wide range. There, there, are, there are dozens of special order uh, costing books in the archives, and you know, most of the time you don't have a, the name of somebody that commissioned them. You, they'll just have um, the initials of a person. In the case of the Sachem Trophy picture, there is a name, a name of a person who ordered it. I don't think we um, have, you know, dug in to find out who exactly that man was, but um, he made plenty of, of orders for what we think are all these Newport um, sailing trophies. So 
Um, there, there is a bit of information to, to be had there, and there were certainly lots and lots of uh, special orders placed that can be tracked. Oh, one thing I should add to that is that there were a lot of, um, a lot of the trophies were commissioned for the U.S. Navy. Uh, Gorm had a lot of um, Navy contract work for battleship silver. That was one aspect of their naval contracting business, but the other <coughs> connection that gave them was to the Navy sporting clubs. So they did a lot of trophies for Navy sporting awards. You don't need to travel to South Africa to, to find them. There are, the, the east side is awash in them. You go up to the Lippitt House Museum, there's several sailing trophies in there. Um, the Benefit Street Armory has a great cup from the early 1900s where the, um, the United Train of Artillery that was in there won the award for artillery proficiency so many years in a row that they retired the cup, and it, it now rests there. Um, so these, you know, if you haven't been properly sated by what you see upstairs, just walk around the east side, you'll find these things. If there aren't any other questions, I might just take this opportunity to ask um, each of our speakers, um, although we all were coming to this with a fair degree of knowledge, what was something that in your research you found particularly interesting or maybe something that you didn't know? I'm gonna start with Janine, if you don't mind, I'll put you on the spot. Didn't give you much time to think about that. Well, I think uh, maybe it was the chafing dishes. They were really not, I just wasn't that familiar with them. I knew of a few by other makers, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize it was kind of an industry in and of itself. I think there were at least three or four books on just chafing dishes produced by Gorm, mm -hmm. and then there were another half dozen that I found elsewhere. So it was a fashion, and I, I, I was talking to my husband last night, and I thought, well, it's, maybe it's the fondue pot of the <laughs> turn of the <laughs> yeah. 20th century. But, uh, so it had that a certain novelty, but it never quite went away, and I see them now with different eyes. I think for me it was the broad reach of the company and how they, uh, I had no idea that they had a manufacturing uh, plant in Montreal or um, in Birmingham, so that was of interest. And also, I really enjoyed um, finding those incredible photographs of the interiors of the retail spaces and thinking about, you know, we see these pieces often in very different um, environments today and what that experience would have been like to walk into one of those groin vaulted sales rooms and see this uh, abundance of, of glittering, um, magnificently created uh, pieces. Yeah, for me, um, as somebody who's worked with the archives, all oh, 6,000 linear feet of it, <laughs> I would say there were a series of surprises. And one of the first things that really surprised me was uh, finding information and, and uh, artifacts related to their wartime production, especially for World War II. Um, I found a parachute down there one day. Uh, who knew that Gorham was you know, making parachutes during World War II? Um, but apparently the ladies who sewed the liners for the cases uh, were deployed during World War II to sew these parachutes. Um, Gorm was also extruding metal shells, not only for World War I, but for World War II, and they really poured themselves wholesale into war production uh, for both World Wars, uh, and that was kind of a surprise. And the other surprise was um, when we started working with RISD on a, um, a joint project funded by IMLS for a planning grant, um, uh, one of the former salespeople at Gorham, James Austinton, who lives in Jamestown, um, came up to talk to us, and he told me a story I'd never heard of before about Gorham bringing back somebody, I think a RISD alum, um, to design fine china for them. And this person had worked at Royal Dalton, and they brought him back, and he, did, he they bought a china company in Flint Ridge, California, and renamed it Gorham China, and for a very short amount of period of time, they produced fine china, because they were trying to go total tabletop. Um, and that was kind of a surprise. It didn't last very long, but you know, just the amazing breadth and reach of things the company attempted to manufacture was kind of fascinating to me. I would say going, I, I think I went through all the photo uh, record books, um, which are just an amazing, amazing, amazing resource. Um, <clears throat> the thing that surprised me was, first of all, the just 
the sheer multiplicity of forms and the ingenious ways that they reuse those casting patterns and different elements to make slight variations. Um, it's just astonishing. On one page, you'll have six different objects that have these same things. And where they all are today, who knows? But um, And the other thing that surprised me is the staying power of some of the styles. Because these photo books are roughly chronological. And you're finding Rococo revival and neo Grec things still being made in the 1880s. Um, they, once these designs were introduced, there were still people that liked them. And you know the art historical tendency is to kind of neatly, the way I sort of did, line it all up, and it, it changes and it changes and it changes. But in fact, they were still making neo Greek things in the 1880s, so that that surprised me. And it's an, a nice contrast that you would love the forms and the pictures. And and as a writer, someone who deals in text, I'm really looking for archival materials that are going to speak in words to the past. And let me give you my second favorite, tied for second favorite, my favorite. Okay, the tied, the, the tied for second is Jabez uh, Gorham's will. And, and because you see other, you, I kind of portrayed him to you as sort of a Luddite, you know, he didn't want to come into the 19th century. Not really. Um, he was an early investor in the, what became the uh, American Screw Company. And American Screw held, uh, bought the patent and monopolized the patent by bribing English manufacturers to keep out of the country. Uh, the, uh, the gimlet screw, and up until this point, every screw made in, a, made in America was cut off flat, and it was really hard to get it started, but the gimlet screw, they invented a machine that would cut it off shop, and so, you know, he invested his money into a place that used machinery, technology, this is Jabez, not John, and uh, unlike his son, he died a very wealthy man, and that was, he had a, a lot of money in that. So that kind of you know, gave me a little insight, more insight into him than what I was stereotypically thinking of him. But my favorite document had to be that, that 1852 journal where John Gorham gets on that steamship and goes over to England. And you know, the level of detail, he's, looking, he's writing down all the patents, uh, uh, patterns of silverware that are served on that ship with an eye of, uh, I'm going to get into this market, you know? He, he, uh, <laughs> I almost showed you what for time didn't, with, uh, a paragraph where he says, um, you know, went to see Nasmith today to make preliminary arrangements about the machine. You know, it's, it's like the moment where he approaches James Nasmith and, uh, and contracts to, to make the steam press. And uh, so the, the level of detail, and not only on manufacturing, but on cultural things he was seeing in, in England, and particularly where he talked to a man a total Dick Dickinsonian character who makes his living crawling through sewer tunnels and f picking out whatever might have fallen through drains. So he says the guy was very pale and gray and didn't smell all that good. Um, and uh, one day he had found a gold coin underneath a particular sewer. So every day he always made sure he checked out that particular sewer, you know? I mean, it's a really wonderful document. And, and the archive is, is full of that kind of material. It's just, I, I mean, I you know, didn't exhaust it by any means, not 6,000 square feet of it. Um, well, I, I have to admit, almost four years ago when I was on the phone with Elizabeth interviewing for this job, um, and she told me about this uh, exhibition of Gorm Silver that she was going to be working on, I thought, wow, that's great. I, I know a bit about silver. Four years later, I've realized I didn't know anything about silver back then, nearly hardly any of what I know now. And, you know, coming to this uh, position from um, somebody who's really interested in craft and making, I was just blown away by going through the costing books and realizing just how many hours it took to make a single piece. I mean, you know, sometimes hundreds of, of hours and how many hands one piece would, would go through, um, you know, from spinning and chasing and engraving. Um, so many people uh, came together to make one piece of silver. It's really incredible. Probably the, the making was the thing that I learned the most about as well. You know, as an art historian, sometimes you don't always know how things are physically made. And uh, one of the most enjoyable experiences about this project has been talking with the silversmiths and people in this community who are makers and are silversmiths 
and they have been so generous and so kind with their time, and that has been a very rewarding experience. Um, I would like to invite you to join some of those silversmiths upstairs in the gallery uh, for them to share more um, knowledge and experience and stories with you. Uh, I would like to first, however, thank all of the speakers for coming today and sharing their knowledge with us. And I would also like to thank you for coming to the RISD Museum today to share this experience with us. Thank you. If, Elizabeth, if I, I could just say one, one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt. When I, I'm a silver restorer, and I have seen silver from all over the world for the past 35 years, I want you to concentrate on those pieces of martelet because they are far and away the finest chasing that has ever been produced in the world. So really hone in on that and take a look at all the detail. Thank you.